Welcome back to another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With, and today our with is David Jeffs from Australia. So David, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, like many of the teachers that will be watching us, I've been teaching long enough now not to uh, add the years up. Uh, but what, one thing that uh, might be of interest is uh, ever since, uh, whether it was a face-to-face um, model or um, regardless of where I was in schools, um, I've always virtualised my courses, uh, whether they were practical subjects or more academic orientated subjects. So I've always uh, enjoyed playing in, this, uh, in the space of blended and online learning. Since about my recent history, uh, since 2010, I've been principal of Riverside's Distance Education School, where I shifted the school from being um, a booklet-based delivery uh, through to an online school. And then more recently, um, oh, well, during that time, actually, during 2011 and 2013, I led a action research project to explore the administrative and the pedagogical adjustments that teachers need to make to virtualise their classroom. And that was part of a master's uh, research degree, which then led on to um, in 2015 to now, where that followed on to a PhD to better understand the student voice aspect. What are the students, um, Queensland students anyway, um, experience of the barriers and the enablers in online learning? So I've had a bit of an interest in this space. And uh, in terms of career rising from 2018, I've taken on the whole school. So Riverside has a campus school of about 750 kids and we have a distance education school, an online school with about 650. So uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much been my interest over the last number of years. Okay. Now, I know in the case of Australia, you guys are in the middle of a term now, so you don't have the ending and beginning that a lot of the North American schools are facing, but you'll still have a change of courses at the end of this term and likely just experience a change of courses in the term that's only recently began. Um, What advice would you have for school leaders on how they can plan and prepare for anything that might have gotten lost or overlooked as we made this transition to the distance environment sort of in a hurry? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess the best way to answer that would be um, for us to all be thinking about one thing. So the answers um, make some relevance. So let's assume uh, that uh, somewhere along the line you decide to keep um, utilising online learning as a bit of a thought bubble for us as I respond to these. So I guess if you do decide to retain online learning or ramp up your blended learning models, um, I think being very careful of making that space a content dump. Um, So a mistake is to throw everything you've got Um, up there and all in one space where the kids can't make sense of it. So I'd say that's a space uh, to be careful of. I think another one um, that we should always be mindful of is differentiation in the online space. Now, in the last recent um, event, through the COVID event, um, that's been a bit difficult because a teacher wouldn't be able to normally um, do that differentiation as perhaps we would if we were planning out developing an online space Um, So in this instance, um, really, one of the things we noticed was uh, our teachers were trying to do everything for every child, and that just wasn't realistic in the time frame um, that we had. So we encouraged our teachers to keep that differentiation simple, um, to obviously take that assessment task or that learning piece or that instructional mode uh, that's designed for for the student at level, and then just to simply make one adjustment for those that needed more scaffolding or simplification of that, or conversely, Uh, to find some extension in that. So we try to encourage the teachers not to try to make something new for every every scenario, um, but try to leverage that piece of work that's already for the mainstream students, which the majority of uh, our students were anyway. So it's just being thoughtful about, okay, what does differentiation look like in the virtual space? Probably another one um, that we worked with our team around was making sure that the structure of the virtual place was simple. Um, so, for example, in our distance ed- education school, our online school there, it's very advanced, that structure, but that wasn't realistic to expect that from our campus-based school that was suddenly forced to deliver the same content that they had only been trained to deliver face-to-face in a blended or a virtual mode. So we tried to encourage our teachers to keep the structure of that virtual space as simple as possible, and if they had more than one virtual class, um, to make sure they replicated that same uh, layout for um, that second class. Because the difficulty for the kids is, for them to go into different ways of how things are laid out, what they have to do is they have to have this, this skill of being able to deconstruct how the teacher thinks 
So we've, we encouraged our students to keep that very simple. Um, the other one would be to um, keep the, uh, leverage as much administrative support as possible, try to take as many administrative duties off of teachers um, as possible. Um, so they're all comments related to resources and content. Um, the other area that I make some comments on is communication and socialisation. Um, so just so you know in the back of my head, I'm giving these answers um, out of three, three domains. The first one being resources and content, the second one socialisation and communication, and then the last um, a construct, which these are all the three contract constructs from a PhD. The last one is the teacher-student relationship. So uh, the second area that I'm talking about is the communication and socialisation. So really it's about um, making sure that the teachers had regular communication with the class and with the, with the parents. And as they do that with the kids, to make sure that they create some sort of socialisation opportunity for the class, perhaps some sort of social discussion forum where you really personalise that, where you're using the student's first name, where you're remembering and recalling personal details about the students because that transactional distance, um, the perceptions that the kids have there uh, is, is very interesting and it's important for us to make sure that we keep that um, as, as personable as we can so we can create socialisation opportunities in the online space, which then leads me to the last area where we worked with our teachers and that was the teacher-student relationship. Adjusting, um, encouraging our teachers to adjust their expectation of uh, their experience that they would have with the same students in their face-to-face -face class because it is different in the online space. You'll find some students perhaps who were very interactive and responsive in a face-to-face -face context, perhaps um, learning through uh, a computer means um, is a barrier for that child. So making sure that they make those adjustments for those individual students, particularly the ones that they've known or taught before. We um, also encourage our, our teachers to make sure they spend a few moments in each online session making those connections with students, asking them how they are, you know, what's been going on at home, how's the cat, all those sorts of things. Just trying to make it personable for them. Um, and then use the students, we encourage our teachers to use the students' names in the live session, even though um, the, the student may not be interacting or responding in a discussion forum or a thread. We encourage our teachers to look out for those quiet students or those students that aren't using the hand um, icon and going, hey, Jimmy, what do you think about that? Are you on board with that? Um, and just calling out names to help bring that um, teacher-student connection there. So that was some of, the, some of the things that we were encouraging our teachers with as they made the adjustment from very quickly from delivering face-to-face -face where they were very comfortable um, to a space where some practitioners who had 35 years in were suddenly significantly confronted with this new mode of delivery. So we wanted to really give them some assurance. And thankfully, we had some experience in a distance education school. We've had a couple of research projects here, so we're able to really um, provide some, some sensible um, advice for them uh, as they made those adjustments from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Okay. Now, I know we were chatting earlier and you were telling me that uh, you guys are starting to open up your society again. The kids are starting to come back next week in, in waves. Um, one of the things that we're likely going to see as we start to bring people back to a somewhat normal life is there's going to be local flare-ups that are going to happen. And um, this being a pandemic, you know, there's likely in the, the fall or winter of next year a second wave that will come around. So there's a high likelihood that some school systems, maybe the complete system is going to have to shut down again at some point. Based on your experiences, what advice would you have for school leaders as to how they can start to prepare now when they've got folks coming back to make the next time we have to close down a little more seamless than the sort of abrupt way we had to do it this time? Yeah, sure. I'll try to keep this um, response short. I realise the last one's a bit longer. Look, in short, uh, probably here, well, not probably, we are. When the teachers um, come back, <clears throat> we're going to have a conversation about the new normal and we're going to um, listen to the staff and to see what new learnings that we've all walked away uh, from this experience with and try to find those things that added value um, and, we thought, and we found to be beneficial and helpful um, and perhaps uh, embedding those into our practice now, even we, while we might have the kids face to face again, like you've said, Michael, rightly so, um, we need to be ready to jump back into that space fairly quickly. So um, we're first of all going to talk to the team and to find out what that experience was like from them 
And same again, uh, we'll probably take advantage of um, the knowledge we have from our distance education and online team and um, allow them to provide that next level of scaffolding and training. So I think some sort of debrief needs to take place uh, where uh, school leaders are listening and, um, you know, we're often running um, uh, with all the answers and we're jumping from thing to thing. But I think in this instance, it's going to be important for us to just slow down and to really listen, um, to have those meetings, to, to listen to what the problems were and the barriers were. And potentially, and I know we've all got financial um, limits in relation to uh, our um, expenditure and um, future plans for our schools, um, but potentially leaving and making sure that our financial management is ready um, in case we need to jump back into this space. And we've obviously learned some things through this experience and we might be able to invest um, a bit better, uh, getting ready for the, if there was to be a, another event. So I definitely say, uh, make sure you're having those debriefs with, uh, with your um, executive teams or school leadership teams and um, make sure you meet with those teachers and listen really carefully as to, okay, what was that experience? I know some principals, it's been many, many years since we've been in the classroom, it might be many, many years since we've taught um, or even learnt uh, in an online space. So I think this is a space, it's a new space, and I think it's one that we don't need to worry about not having all the answers. Um, I think it's a space where we need to model um, our, our willingness and our, our flexibility to learn and to adapt and perhaps adjust our uh, school um, strategic plans uh, to better position and be ready to respond in the best way as possible. The last comment uh, I'll make in this is um, I'm making a consideration, and I spoke to my executive team this week, I'm making consideration for the fact that we are not going to achieve this year the normal things that we were hoping to. We're acknowledging the disruption that this has caused on potentially KPIs, on normal literacy and numeracy improvements, and we're ready to defend that at higher levels. So you might be a part of a larger school system. Um, I'd encourage you not to be shy of bringing that into the conversation. The impact of this event is probably unmeasured at this time, um, but um, I just encourage you to, to count that cost, uh, particularly with your local team of leaders, um, because we've been operating, I don't know about you guys, but we've been operating at such a high strategic level consistently as the information has changed so quickly and so rapidly. I see that I'm exhausting um, what I would normally get in a year out of these people in a month. So I'd encourage school leaders to just consider what is the impact um, that this has had on our school leaders. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, David. This has Welcome. been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with has been David Jeffs. Thank you.